Welcome to CAN TV once again for another of our online workshops. I'm Eric Torres, a trainer here at CAN TV. I'm Andrea, also a trainer. How's it going? Yeah, and um, we're going to be opening it up to questions. Uh, we're going to open up participant microphones so that if anybody wants to uh, talk with and chat with us and ask questions about anything having to do with producing a show at CAN TV, you're going to be totally welcome to do that. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to be heard, that's fine. You could also just type in your questions in the chat, you know, the chat box, and we'll, we'll look at it, we'll see it, and we'll answer it. And if you don't have a lot of questions, that's OK, too, because you know, we got a lot we can cover and talk mm -hmm. about today. So let's, uh, let's start just by putting it out there. Does anyone out there have a question for us? Yeah, and off we, the bat. Yeah. Hey, Zazel. Hey. How are, how are you? How's it going? Yeah, what's, what can we answer you for? Any questions yet? You don't have any questions yet? No. Nah. Okay. okay, okay, that's okay. <laughs> but nice to hear from you. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you'll have some questions as we go along. At some point. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess we'll just go ahead and start. Um, at least you could tell us a, a general area that you're mostly interested in. So maybe field production, editing, studio, studio box. Any particular area you're interested in us jumping into? Some we want to cover like anything really, but we want to mm -hmm. see if we can if we can talk about some things that we don't usually get a chance to talk about in the classes. You know, a little deeper and or just some little. Niche thing. Yeah. <laughs> Some area that you might not be so sure about. So any yeah. particular area you're interested in? Well, you know, with me editing, but I've been working with um, Andrea. She's uh -huh. been, you know, assisting me step by step on, on the alternative uh, editing software. Mm -hmm. And I really do appreciate it. Great. Yeah, for sure. No, I'm happy to help. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have that edit program on this computer, so I can't really help you out right, on that specifically. Right, yeah. But um, yeah, but uh, even if you have just general questions about editing, we can definitely talk about it. Um, you know, even though you're using a different program, a lot of stuff is still similar uh, mm -hmm. to Elements. Um, but yeah. yeah um, we can also just talk about, in general, where we see editing going and how the industries that create the software, what, what is their thought process? What, what, what are we, what's the hell's going on with <laughs> editing software these days? Yeah, yeah. Just that's so we a, can, yeah. That's a good question. Um, Get a grasp on it. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, these past couple of months have been pretty wild because I've been having to learn quite a bit about uh, online or free editing programs that I never even, you know, came across until a couple weeks ago, frankly. Um, and the one that you're using, HitFilm, seems pretty decent for mm -hmm. free. <laughs> um, and it's actually got a lot of similarities to Premiere Pro. It's actually probably closer in relation to Premiere Pro than I would say it is to Premiere Elements. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah. So I guess, you know, the, the silver lining of your current struggles is that if you ever wanted to upgrade to Premiere Pro, it wouldn't be too much of a big jump for you. Um, and frankly, it would probably, I mean, it would definitely look better than HitFilm. But um, hmm. as a whole, I mean, yeah, I'm constantly impressed by how, how good these free editing programs seem to be. And then also, um, you know, I th we're definitely hoping and we've been pushing and maybe one day we'll be able to get uh, an alternative editing program here at CAN that you guys can start using. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, just to give a little overview, the, um, the two big, the three big editing softwares began with, you know, it was... Adobe, well, Adobe Premiere was kind of small potatoes because Final Cut Pro and Avid were the two big editing softwares Definitely. that professionals used. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, at some point, Adobe decided they wanted to compete and they want to get in the game, so they really uh, upped the ante and d developed their own software and came up with Adobe Premiere. And, and it, Premiere actually kind of in some ways surpassed uh, Final Cut Pro in some ways. Now, all softwares, there is no perfect software. They all have mm -hmm. advantages and disadvantages. So yeah, Adobe had some things better than Final Cut and Avid and vice versa. They all have areas that they're really good at. 
Um, mm -hmm. But what happened is Apple decided to get out of the game, really. They just decided they're done with professional uh, editing software. They decided to go for the prosumer market of consumers. Just money, just money. They yeah. just saw dollar signs there. And so Final Cut Pro kind of got phased out. And some people still use it, you know, but we're using legacy versions of it or mm -hmm. we're using the prosumer version, which is Final Cut X. And Final Cut X definitely has some advantages for people that are new to editing, but you know, for people who've been editing a long time, professionals, it's no, it's it's totally an, an, an inadequate program. <laughs> Limiting. Um, yeah, have you used you it know, at all? Because I have not. I tested it out. Yeah. I delved into it just to just to make a decision on it, mm -hmm. and I could see the arguments for and against it. And yeah. and I basically felt I didn't like it. I was like, but then I always change my mind. I always <laughs> start out hating something and then learning to love it. And yeah, that's true. Vice versa. <laughs> yeah. You know. Um, I would definitely agree. There's, uh, yeah, I've actually, I've, I've had experience editing on Avid. I've had experience editing on Final Cut Pro 7, the, like, OG. That's what I use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, then, um, and then in Premiere as well. And, and, yeah, I've just kind of adjusted to Premiere so much at this point that it's, yeah, it's a, it'd be more of a struggle for me to... Um, do yeah. anything else. But Premiere is, there, Adobe is kind of a, a, a victim of their own success. So, you know, so many people have transferred over to them because of uh -huh. the, the demise of Final Cut Pro mm -hmm. that they got lazy and decided we don't have to make it better and better and better. We can just, pre you know, just make it more and more complex to make yeah. it look like it's better. But then all kinds of bugs happen, things don't work right, it gets all slow and this and that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, they kind of got ahead of themselves. Yeah. And so another phenomenon is another software called DaVinci Resolve has come along. And they were just a color correction software, mm -hmm. but they have, you know, they were like the industry standard for color correction in Hollywood. And then they decided they, you know, I mean, they didn't decide. It just kind of like some of their features actually allow for video editing. And those features have just gotten better and better. And so now it's totally a capable video editing software, aside from being a, a magnificent color correction software. And they have a free version of it. Yeah. And the thing is, you have to have a very powerful computer to use it, though. And there is a learning curve, just like with any professional software. Mm -hmm. But it's all these softwares, like you were saying, Andrea, are so similar that conceptually that if you know one of them, you can pretty, you know, it's not hard to, 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 to adjust to another one. Right, yeah. Well, yeah, know. at the end of the day, just, just kind of take time and, and, and fiddling around and <laughs> making yeah. mistakes. And <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, even me personally, like I'm still actively learning how to like better use the program. Um, I've had like a personal experience very recently where I, uh, the way that I did my workflow, so that's like how I chose to go about editing, like how like I uh, chose to save my files, how I chose to name my files, my file structure, um, how I used all my video clips. I was using this one way for a very long time and it worked for me great, but then I had my first experience where I, um, we actually, I paid somebody to do color grading on something that I was working on and they were using DaVinci Resolve, but because of the way that I organized all my files, it didn't work, and so um, we like couldn't use Resolve to do the color, and so we had to like find another way. So I mean, hmm. it's really frustrating. It could be very frustrating. I still personally, constantly like am learning how to better use these programs, and um, there's some things that like I mean, I only know what I know because I made a mistake the first time. That's truly the case, hmm. <laughs> nine times out of ten. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, you know, a good rule of thumb is to have a backup plan, as we always are saying, have, mm -hmm. a, have a plan B. So if you just kind of toss everything into one basket, you're, you're, you're skating on thin ice, to use two metaphors in a row. But um, anyway, so it's, you know, it's just good to think ahead a little bit and like think, okay, um, how can I be sure that this a really important event that I'm recording, that I'm going to be sure that I have good usable audio afterwards? You know, I think most people make the mistake of just recording in the camera, and that's that. And then later you may find that your settings were bad on your camera or something, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. it's distorted. And so one of the things that we recommend is to do what you call dual system audio. And so one, one thing we have here at CanTV is a Tascam recorder, um, digital recorder. Um, it's pretty easy to use. 
you know, it's battery powered or you can plug it in with, with a USB cable that comes with it. Um, you just kind of power it up and choose some settings and it asks you some questions on this little screen and you push a button and say yes or no. There's a selection button on it. And there's a menu button, there's black buttons here. There's a menu button and you can scroll through different menus as you can see. There's a record menu. So what does this record on? You can record on SD cards. Okay. Uh, okay, recording settings. Okay, here, you just, if you can get a shot of the screen there. There's a lot of different choices. And so I'll just summarize it so I don't bore you to death with this little screen. <laughs> but, um, you know, you can do a uh, high quality recording. It can be 48 kilohertz, which is what television standard is 48 kilohertz means 48,000 samples per second. Uh, that's high quality digital audio. Uh, you can don't record an MP3. That's not a good idea. That's really low quality. Mm -hmm. Usually you want to record in a WAV file, uh, WAV, and uh, there's a choice. And, and there's choices between 24 bit and 16 bit bits. That's how many. Um, the depth of the of the sampling. So there's a 16-bit and a 24-bit choice. I would, depending on the quality of the audio, like if you're recording music, you want to go higher, as usually as high as possible. Um, and so 24-bit in this case at 48k, 48 kilohertz. Um, those are some basic settings that you want to take advantage of and set, mm -hmm. you know, your record to. So let's, you know, we can always do a tutorial one-on-one -on -one if. Uh, for using this and so people can get more comfortable with this. But basically once you make your settings, you can then put this near your talent. Um, it, there's a little sc screw mount on the back of this, so um, there, it comes with a handle in the kit. There's a little handle here that screws in, as you can see. And then this can be handheld or you know, maybe placed on a table, something like that. Um, a lot of good possibilities with how you position that. But anyway, you know, as far as where, how close to the sound source, things like that, that can get pretty deep of a conversation um, <laughs> because it depends on the strength of that sound. Uh, if it's someone's just simply speaking, then you want it to have it fairly close. It is a condenser mic, so it's pretty sensitive. And you do it, usually you do a sound test. So you come out of your menu, you push record once, it starts to flash. Um, so if we want to see a flash, there you go, see that little flashing light. And so you can see that it's showing me my levels as I speak. And so then on the side of it, there's a little sensitivity setting there, plus and minus. Uh, microphone, okay, it says input level plus and minus. So I would be pushing these to increase, see how I'm increasing the sensitivity, it's getting louder and louder, or decrease the sensitivity in you know, relation to my voice. And just see as I mash this, the sound peaks get lower and lower and lower until I decide on a good level. And so a good level, many of you will remember, is a minus 12 is the highest you want to go. Mm -hmm. They have a little, it's hard to see on probably on this camera, but there's a tiny little arrow there that shows you where the minus 12 is. And so that's the level you, you don't want to go past. You don't want to go beyond minus 12. So anyway, once you set your level, you're ready to go. And you would push that record button again, and it becomes a solid red light. And now it's recording me at that high quality, 48 kilohertz, 24-bit you know, depth. And you can, you can also set this up to record four tracks. So right now, it's, it's just set up for two tracks. That's why you're seeing the two lines bouncing around. Mm -hmm. But you can set it up for four tracks. And um, in that case, two tracks are set at the level that you're setting. And the other two tracks are recording at a little bit lower of a level. And so then you have, a, you have that choice in post-production. You can use, if the, if the main recording is too loud and it's distorting, you have the other two tracks that were recorded at a lower level automatically that you can use instead. So that way you're not getting distorted audio. Because as you guys know, you don't want to distort your audio. You want to make sure you get good quality audio at the beginning of the process. Mm -hmm. The better it is at the start, 
the better it is later on when you're editing with it. It's like garbage in, garbage out. You know, you don't, you can't fix a lot of things yeah. in post production. You can improve them a little, but miracles. We don't have a lot of miracles <laughs> in this in this industry. So unfortunately not. Yeah, even though we got a lot of uh, you know preachers and religious folks who use our equipment. <laughs> Somehow has not quite been blessed. I yes, guess. no, the, it doesn't just happen. You know, <laughs> you got to put an effort into it. So yeah. anyway, so that's that's one of your choices. But like I was saying, this is what we call dual system audio. And so with dual system audio, you have to, you know, you're recording in the camera. But you're also recording on this external device. And later you're going to have to synchronize those. And so a good practice, if, you know, is to start recording. You hit record on your camera and you hit record on your recorder, they're both recording. Um, if you didn't set any time code or anything, yeah. that's okay, you can still do a hand clap. <laughs> <laughs> you can do a hand clap, that's one choice you have. Yeah, making sure, um, of course, that the hand is in the shot when you do clap. Yes, the hands should be visible. And so, yeah, this lens would have to be pointing at her hands, mm -hmm. obviously. So we can see the hands meeting, and we would hear them on the soundtrack. And it's easy to, to match those up later in post-production on your timeline. Your audio will have a huge spike where the hands clap. Mm -hmm. And visually, we'll see the hands frame by frame. We'll see the moment that they actually come together. And then we line those up, and there we go. We're in sync. That's how you yeah. can synchronize it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so it's important to then, you know, if you're doing dual system is you also, even if you're not using, obviously you're not going to use the audio from the video camera, but you still need to get audio so you are able to sync. That's really important. Also, the other thing you said about recording on four tracks on that um, task cam and being able to kind of pick between the lower and the higher level. I do something similar to that if I'm just recording onto the camera itself. If I have a... Um, uh, if I only have one source of audio and it's all on, and I have it on the left and the right track, um, I'll have one track just padded down just a little bit, just as a safety. And that's really important, especially if you're like a one-man yeah. band and you don't really have the opportunity to, um, you know, maybe you're doing a lot of stuff at once and you don't have the opportunity to be as, ride the levels as much as you would like, you know, consistently, then I definitely kind of have one that's, you know, a good chunk lower than the other, just as a safety. Um, and also, I'm sure you guys probably know from using the field cameras, they like don't, uh, <laughs> the level, the little level um, knob is, you know, it's very like, uh, it's pretty chunky. It doesn't slide very well. You know, you, you hit it a little bit and it goes down a lot. So I try to like make it so I don't even have to put myself in a situation of having to ride the levels too hard in general. Yeah, just to show what she's talking about. Yeah. Um, she's talking about these level setting buttons right here. Um, these little white knobs, mm -hmm. these are, they're hard to move by design. You know, that's so that you don't accidentally bump them because you bump it, if you move it just a little, as she said, it will really change the level. Yeah. So these are made to set the level. They're not made to ride the level, to ride, adjust in real time, not, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, if you are gonna take it to that level, which we hope some of you do, that level, <laughs> um, then it's a good idea to, instead of using the camera pots, those potentiometers, you would use a mixer, an external mixer that has, you know, these little knobs on this mixer are very smooth. It's really easy to turn these, and a little bit of that just goes a little way. It doesn't radically change the sound level. Um, so this is really good for writing levels. And the sound that you're hearing in your external mic, uh, your, sorry, not mic, your headphone jack on the side here, um, that is much louder. You can hear it much better than the headphone jack on the camera. Mm -hmm. You know, you can adjust that audio level on here also. There's, there's a little knob here to set your level for your headphones here on the side, this little knob right here. Um, so yeah, it, those are crucial. If you want to, if you really care about audio and you want to get good quality audio, it's a good idea to master an external device like this, like this mixer, mm -hmm. to monitor your levels better, to adjust your levels better. This also has limiters on it. It's got a high pass filter on it. What does that mean? A limiter, the limiter switch, little tiny switch on, the, on each of these 
inputs, each of these pots. Okay, see the limiter, limiter right there. Um, the limiters will cut off, like if, if the sound peaks too high, uh, it, will, it will cut off that, those, those, those spikes of the, of the sound wave. It'll chop them off. But in a smooth way, the, the better the mixer, the more smooth is the cutoff. Um, but it's not my favorite tool. The limiter, it, you will hear dropout. Yeah. If you're using a limiter and the sound spikes are really loud, it'll just sound like it drops out. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, you can use it if, you, if it's a really uh, extreme situation. But um, the high pass filter, HPF, which is right next to the limiter, HPF, high pass, also known as bass roll off. Because what that does is it allows high frequencies to, cu to come through, but it will limit low frequencies. And that's a different scenario. That's more like when you're dealing with external noise that you can't shut off. It's like, you know, there could be trains rumbling by, mm -hmm. buses, maybe airplanes. Yeah, an air conditioner. Yes, lots of different sources of a low frequency rumble. Mm -hmm. You can use the high pass filter, AKA the bass roll off, to help eliminate some of that noise. And also, like we were saying before, the best place to start is on the microphone itself, on this, this beginning of the chain, the beginning of the whole system, the source, which is, it starts at the microphone. And so a lot of these microphones have a bass roll off switch. This one, you can see it, it's a little slot right there. It's hard. To, to just move with your finger, it's so small, you probably need a, a, like a pen or something. Yeah, a pen or a paper clip. But there's two positions. There's a line dip position. And then the other position was there's a flat line position, which you see there. So that's the pretty that's the symbol for the actual filter. It's called a base roll-off filter. So if you're in that situation, yeah, use it. Now if you're not in that situation, there's all these all these devices, they have all these features that are fancy and you're tempted to use, but mm -hmm. don't use it if you don't need it. Why? Because if you're filtering out bass sounds that aren't even there, like, you know, we don't have a bass problem in the studio, for example, so right. it affects all, you know, all sounds. So our voices would also be kind of squelched, would also be smoothed down, would be flattened a little bit. It yeah, sounds you'll like, lose something. Yeah, like a pillow is over ours. Uh, unnecessarily. <laughs> kind of like right now. Yeah, yeah. it sounds like you got a mask on, right? <laughs> a mask on top of a mask. Yeah. Um, so, the, so don't use that. And on the camera, you don't use the optical image stabilizer if you don't need it. And that's yes. OIS, a little button. Yeah, you'll see like the little handshake. Let me show it real okay. fast. Um, if you look at the screen back there, uh, actually this camera had it on when I turned it on, so you do have to kind of watch out for it. But you see I'm, I'm just kind of tapping the OIS button. And you see that little hand, little wavy hand, shaky thing. Um, yeah, I almost always tend to try to keep that off. Even if I am going handheld, that's, um, it's just one less thing that you're able to control, you know? It's one, one less thing that might go wrong if you have that OIS filter on. And it does have its place, though. So, um, but yeah, if, before we move on uh, to anything else, does anybody have any questions right now off the top of their head? I see we have one more person joined in on the session. Um, yeah, I'm just see the, the See, who's, who's directing this? <laughs> who's uh, uh, Rob from Community Partners. Rob, he's he's directing right Rob now. Rob Galetta. Okay, yeah. so just one person back there, huh? We have in the control um, room? two people back there right now. So yeah, so Rob's, okay. Rob's directing and also the TD. And then um, Chris is on audio and he's also monitoring the Zoom session as well. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that's kind of how we have it hooked up. Oh, um, well, yeah, there they are. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the new normal. We have a, a, okay. a skeleton crew, mm -hmm. although they look well fed, um, <laughs> running the control room, a max of two people. Here yeah. in the studio, we have a max of two crew people, um, which are they're behind the scenes. They're in the dark. You can't see them right now, mm -hmm. unless they want to try to get shots of each other. Yeah. Eric, you feel like getting a shot of your... Uh, of of oh, Jeremy yeah. over there, that'd be great. Um, if you can. So yeah, <laughs> it's a it is a skeleton crew. Okay. <laughs> <I see. laughs> skeleton crew, and mm -hmm. up here on the stage, uh, us talent, talent so to speak. Um, 
We actually have room for one more because you have a maximum of three allowed on the stage. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also, we don't actually have to wear these masks. If you're talent and you're more than six feet apart, yeah. which we're roughly six we're or seven about feet. six feet, yeah. We don't have to wear them. Um, but yeah, you know, we just felt like in solidarity, we're going to wear them. We're going to. We're going to say Richard. Hey, Richard. No, it's not Richard. That's Who was that? That's Eric. Eric. Oh, hey, what's up? The mask. The mask. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, we're just we're we are trying to uh, yeah just just plow ahead and you know you know, being responsible and all that, and yet, you know, have fun and make a good show and mm -hmm. show you guys it is possible. Yeah, I mean, we've got quite the setup that we were able to rig up today. Um, we had uh, obviously more time than the typical person since we were able to kind of use the studio at our at our whim. But um, but yeah, I mean, you, we could still do a full setup. I mean, we've got the whole the whole thing going, and uh, even with just two people in the control room, you know, we're able to put on a pretty decent show. Yeah, and that a lot of that comes down to our pre-production work. Mm -hmm. um, Andrea made the gra well, we we both kind of made the graphics mm -hmm. and um, came up with a game plan here. We've got a whole agenda here. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a meeting with the crew beforehand uh, before the show. We did everything you're supposed to do. Andrea made these lower thirds. There you go. <laughs> Wait, okay, all right. You did it in the CG room. You didn't, you didn't do it before the studio. Um, I know I did it before. So, yeah, I used a program to make them separately, um, and I wow, just saved them as a PNG. That's new to me. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you, you can absolutely do that. Um, you could actually, yeah, make graphics on your own using whatever program you have. I mean, even like, you could even use Paint, frankly, like MS Paint if you wanted to to make graphics, as long as you save it as like either a JPEG or a PNG file. Um, and put on your uh, thumb drive Stick something. it on a thumb drive and you can put it into CG or the, or the TriCaster. You could, you could do that's your new. lower thirds either way. Yeah, yeah, so that's, yeah, I, and especially, Plug in the next workshop. say it again? Plug in the next workshop. Oh, <laughs> sure. What do you say? Um, so yeah, oh, okay, well on the lower third you can see right now is, uh, actually I'm gonna be doing a w workshop about graphics. Um, oh, okay next okay. Thursday, uh, right? Yeah, next Thursday I will do a workshop on graphics. And that one, um, I will be using Premiere Elements to show you how to make graphics on there, but uh, it's gonna be a, a equal parts theory and technical, so just learning about like how to make a graphics look good, how to make it look readable, um, you know, stuff about, about style, and then also about animating the graphics. So I'll also be going over how to animate your own graphics uh, within Premiere Elements, um, oh, wow. so that okay. should be pretty cool. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm excited for that one. Um, but yeah, you can absolutely uh, make your own graphics ahead of time and then stick it into either the TriCaster or the um, or the CG, whichever one. Whatever work again, whatever workflow you're going with. If your TD is really comfortable, if they don't have too much going on, then you know you might as well just put the graphics in the TriCaster. Um, or if you have the number, you know, the crew people. Which I guess, you know what, frankly, I'd be surprised if people use CG um, much at all right now, considering the limit of crew people that can be in the control room. Um, right. So I, I would imagine you probably would end up doing a lot of your graphics in post. I would suggest it anyway. Um, just one less thing you have to do uh, in the moment with, with your such a limited number of crew. Yeah. But it, I don't know, if you can handle it, go for it. <laughs> Anyway, it's sure. just nice to have the um, the flexibility, the ability to use um, any you know a lot of different softwares to create your graphics. Uh, I just think they look more unique that way too, instead of just mm -hmm. using built-in stuff that's here, that's that's in the the, the computer in the control room. Um, just 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 very powerful softwares that allow you to make some very interesting graphics. Yeah, you know, and that's one of the things that make your show, you know, unique, that makes it have your, your touch, gives it your, um, your particular flavor, you know, so. Yeah, and that's even, you know, even more important in the studio, considering it's, you know, kind of a, a stagnant space, and, and there's only, you know, so, well, there's actually quite a bit you can do to make it your own, but um, mm -hmm. graphics is one, you know, probably the easiest way uh, to kind of make something look a little bit more unique to you. Um, 
Because, I mean, I'm sure you've noticed that if you watch the channel, you know, show after show, it can maybe look the same because people just all have the same light set up. They all have the same color background. You know, things start to blend quite a bit. So, um, yeah, if you can uh, just be sure to anything to kind of, yeah, make it your own. Um, yeah, really and helps. another thing you can do, we talk about um, uh, not just digitally doing things, but also in old school kind of way, you can make a cookie, for example, Kukaloris. Um, this is the Can TV one. Um, and th there's a company uh, called Grand Stage and Lighting, and you can order this from them. You can bring them a logo design, and they will make it uh, into this. This one, this particular one, is both kind of a metal cut and also glass. It's an interesting combo yeah. one that they did. Um, the prices range, but anyway, this this is also called a gobo, and so this will go into into the, the gobo holder, the cookie holder. You put it uh, backwards and upside down into the cookie holder, and then the light itself will reverse that and project it onto the curtain back there. And that's kind of an old school you know, thing that you can do. You can put a pattern onto the curtain, as we did in our last workshop. And these range in price from cheap. The cheap ones, the just laser cut metal, are actually, I was surprised how cheap those are. Oh, yeah? Yeah, they're, they're, the catalog is a couple of years old at this point, and, and at that point it was like $12, and that was like a few years ago. So at this point, who knows, maybe $15, $20? Sure. Uh, which is quite cheap, you know, yeah. for a laser cut design. And right. then if you want something more glass, then it starts to get really expensive. <laughs> it's like $80 up to $300, $400, depending yeah. on the kind of colors, if you have multiple colors. But that is cool if it's like your, your show that you're going to do from time to time over and over again. You really want it to look interesting and different. It's, it could be a worthwhile investment to yeah. spend a few hundred bucks on a nice gobo. And, and they were pretty amazing. Um, it, it's, like I said, a very organic look. It's not mm -hmm. a digital look at all. If you want to go organic, that's one thing you can do. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, your set, your gobos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And once you, yeah, once you can... Uh, yeah, once you get one, then you can just pop it in, and, and it just makes a pretty big difference pretty quickly, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. You could even put a gel on top of the the light, uh, the ellipsoidal light. That's the one that does that has the slot for the cookie. Um, you can even put a gel on top, so you could add a color, whatever color you want. You can make it different that way as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a good tool. Yeah. So yeah, we have you know so many different areas that we support here that um, you know we can keep talking about a lot of different things, and so yeah. we're trying to anticipate what some of you may run into, and so part of this is about troubleshooting, and mm -hmm. part of it is about uh, some features that you may not know too much about. Uh, so those of you that shoot with field cameras, um, there's so many features on these Panasonic cameras, and so you know we recently did a workshop on small cameras and cell phones on uh, doing videography with those small devices, which we are, we are ourselves exploring, and they're great. They're wonderful. They, the big advantage of those devices is how small and portable they are. They're just mm -hmm. very light and portable, and so they can be very spontaneously used you know, to capture things that you didn't anticipate. That's great. Does that mean we want to uh, move away from these big cameras and abandon them for some reason? No, not necessarily. You know. <laughs> Uh, we have actually, in the past, in the old studio, we used to use some much you know, smaller cameras that were lighter. Those Sonys we used to use were at least a pound or two lighter than these Panasonics. Oh, yeah. But not as nice. You know, mm -hmm. They didn't have as many like, physical buttons. Yeah. You had to kind of go into menus and other menus, sub-menus. So you, know, you, you always seem to compromise with every device. It's, it gives you advantages, but then there's mm -hmm. disadvantages. There's always a compromise. It looks like we have a question. Um, let's see. Can you show us the process when someone brings in cell phone footage? When someone brings in cell phone footage. OK. And who is that? who's asking the question it's there? It's Ruthie, it looks like. Ruthie? Can okay. you address the process when someone brings in cell phone footage? Yeah, OK, yeah. I mean. Hard to say without knowing what you know, cell phone in particular are working with, but um, uh, I would say that probably the, the big things that you want to watch out for when you're working with cell phone footage is one, of course, <laughs> making sure that you had recorded it uh, 
vertically, not horizontally. That'll make a big difference. Um, and then also making sure that you export it at the proper setting. Um, After timeline's done, what form is the show submitted to using? Memory card, what is the latest format? So yeah, the question was asking about uh, submitting, what format to submit things in, and what we accept now. Um, we do still accept DVDs, absolutely. You can come in, uh, there's actually a little um, drop-off box uh, that's, towards, that's in the parking lot now that you can um, drop off physical DVDs if you like. Uh, or you can submit online now, so you actually can uh, submit. Um, you just have to set up a Google Drive account with um, program services and they'll uh, help you kind of get that set up. So you could just upload uh, your MP4 video. You can upload that and then be able to uh, just kind of set it and forget it and then it'll get uh, scheduled. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in, in submitting online, then uh, I would contact um, traffic at cantv.org, uh, traffic. Um, they'll be able to help out with that for sure. Let's see, okay, what's that other question? Okay, the other question is asking about um, if you're using Adobe Elements 12, will that give you broadcast quality um, results? And the answer is yes, mm -hmm. yes it will. Um, you know, it's, it still has all the capabilities of the, the later version. I mean, not all of the later versions, but ma the, the same basic capabilities. So the output that you're choosing, it's gonna, you can still export an MPEG-4 file. Um, that's what we need here at CAN-TV. Mm -hmm. um, things like that, you can still choose what type of audio. So the AAM, ACM versus uh, Dolby. You know, things like that. Uh, the bit rate, you can still set that at eight megabytes per second. Mm -hmm. You know, so yes, absolutely, it's adequate software. That's a question from Rose Cole. So, hey, Rose, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> how is the weather in Florida? <laughs> I don't know if you can answer or not. But, uh, yeah, you can totally use Elements 12, even though yeah. it's a few years old at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, I, absolutely. And, and, frankly, I would say in general... <laughs> Um, it's not a bad thing to kind of stay a couple versions back from whatever editing software that you're using. I think these days um, editing software seem to think that it's great to kind of constantly be improving and setting out updates. Um, but with those updates tend to almost always come a lot of bugs. So uh, sometimes the older versions of things are actually uh, it's a more stable um, editing program, you're probably less likely to run, run into issues with an older program than you would with a new one, frankly, um, which I know it's kind of seems counterproductive, but uh, that's definitely the case. But um, yeah, as long as you're submitting, as long as you're exporting to the submission guidelines, um, then it really shouldn't matter too much what uh, editing program you're using, as long as you edit, um, export using those guidelines, and as long as you had recorded the video recording you know, is at least 1280 by 720 in resolution and, and is on either um, 30 or 60 frames per second. Yeah, and, and just to finish a little of Ruthie's question, Ruthie, um, you know, as far as the process, uh, bringing in cell phone footage, you know, you don't bring it in cell phone footage directly to CAN TV. I mean, you, you can, if you can export uh, an MPEG-4 file, great. And actually now uh, the system we have is capable of, ex we, we can accept more formats now. Oh, MPEG-4 yeah, right. is the best one, MP4 actually I should call it. MP4 is what your, your file should end with, .mp4. Not MPEG, MPEG, things like that. Those are equivalent, but they're not technically as acceptable as MP4. So you would want to change the file name to MP4 if you have an MPEG-4 file. And so anyway, you know, but if you don't, if you have other types of files like AVIs and things like that, we are mm -hmm. accepting more file types. So if you have footage on a foam, as Andrea was saying, please start by making sure you're shooting horizontally, not vertically. Okay, so start by shooting horizontally. And then look at the export settings. If you're able to edit in the phone, great. We did a cell phone workshop recently that talked about that. Um, so you can edit and export it as an MPEG-4 file or one of the other acceptable files, which I'm sure we're going to be listing on our website soon. Yes. Um, I actually just have the, the email that Leslie from Program Services sent out just the other week saying that it, it can play AVIs 
WMVs and MOV files. So MOV, that's um, a really common format for uh, Mac. Mac likes a lot of MOVs. You're, I think on your iPhone, that's an MOV when you record on your iPhone, right? It is an MOV, what they call container file. Right. The actual file that it records has a different um, ending. It's a different, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't quite read that. Let's see. Says, How is the zebra? The camera? Okay, the zebra. Oh, yeah. Okay, we That's can so talk funny. About that was that. like on our list. Yes. <laughs> that is on our list. <laughs> um, yeah, I can show you All over right. here. So um, the reason you would use the zebra stripes, um, let's see. I might have to open up my iris in order to show the zebra stripes. So um, the zebra stripes, you use those just to make sure, just to keep note of your exposure levels. So um, just to make sure, because you can, you can look at this LCD screen all you like, you can look in the viewfinder all you like, that doesn't necessarily mean your image is properly exposed. And one really good safety is to use the zebra stripes. So when you turn on the zebra stripes where, if I, let me zoom in on something you bright. Be, you could use me if you want. There we go. Whoop. There's Eric. And I could hold up something bright just to help you. Yeah really show that. Let's see. Let me, op let me open up. I'm as right as I can go. I can, you know what, I can see it on my screen. You might not be able to see it. We've got yeah. cameraman behind you getting a hey. shot of your screen, so. There you go. So you might just be able to get a shot of the zebra stripes. You could see it on the base of the napkin a little bit. So those zebra stripes are just telling me that, hey, that, that part of the image, those little bits, are, that's 100% white. That means it's the image is as bright as it can get. It can't get any brighter. Um, yeah, which it's not a bad to have at least a little bit of that. You want to have you know, a good dynamic range in your image, meaning you want to have um, you know, dark darts and light lights. That's going to kind of make your image look a little bit more visually appealing. And so when you have the zebra stripes on, then you'll be able to tell, OK, yeah, you know, it'd be great if it had like a little bit of detail in the hair maybe. Like that would that could be in a little brighter. Whatever the brightest point, you want it to be a little bright. You want it to be um, a little overexposed. That's okay. Um, but yeah, that's that's what you would use the zebra stripes for, is to monitor that. Um, yeah, let's, you have a white mask on, so <laughs> this will be this will be better. Yeah, I get a better shot of it. This will be better with you, I think. Yeah. Um, Okay. okay, let's see. So first off, well, as usual, zoom in and focus. Okay. Yeah. Let me turn this light on. Oh, okay, you... here, we'll get, okay, striking. Yeah, you got it. Striking. Okay. All right, there we go. All right, now, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to, first of all, I'm gonna open it up my iris a lot, and I'm gonna go to a smaller, a, a um, less of a uh, shutter speed here. Go real slow shutter speed. Mm -hmm. And that way, and make sure no ND is on, and my gain is on low. And you know, this usually is a feature used for daylight because daylight is where you're really getting extreme with your lighting. Right. Yeah. And um, also daylight. Um, actually, you know, when you're outside. Uh, the, L the LCD screen is just kind of harder to see when it's like super bright out. Um, so it's just like kind of an, another fail safe to make sure that you're not um, overexposing too much of your image. Okay, oh, here we go. Now, oh. we're, now we're talking. Wow. Okay, so <laughs> she's really blown out there. Yeah. So I'm gonna put my zebra feature on. There we go, and you can really see the lines are just dancing like crazy. Mm -hmm. um, the zebra actually has several settings. So there's a 60% and 85% set up in the camera right now. What that means is it will show you when it reaches that threshold. So if, it, if it's too bright and it's already too bright at a certain point, it'll show you that. If I dial it back down, at some point it disappears. Mm -hmm. And I'll start to dial it up. And I have it set right now for a high threshold, like 80. You can go into your menu too and tell it what, are, what do you want to have your zebra values be. So if I push my menu button um, and start to search, let's see, we're going to go to display setup, I believe. Yeah. There we go. Zebra detect. So zebra detect number one is 60%. 
And so I can actually go into that and choose some other value. Like if I wanted to warn me earlier, like when is it becoming too bright, you know, I can go to 50% instead of 60. And so as soon as the scale, it's a zero to 100% scale. So as soon as the lighting is at 50% of, you know, what you want it to, you know, maximum, it warns you the zebra lines will appear. Zebra detect number two, I can say, no, don't warn me until it's close to 100%, so I'm gonna change it to mm -hmm. 95, for example. So you can even go to higher than 100%. So I'll choose 95 just for the heck of it, and then come out of my menu. <clears throat> and so once again, uh, we look at the subject and with her very white mask, and then we can um, turn on the zebra, and here we are, the 50% menu is showing me quite a few lines already and then I'm dialing my iris down. Now that's too early of a warning system. It's, you know, it's not blown out. We can see details in the shadows mm -hmm. of the mask. And so instead of using the 50% zebra, I'm going to take it up to 95%. See now there's no zebra lines at all. And so now I'm going to start opening my iris. At some point, you'll see the zebra appear. There we go, right there. And so it's showing me that, hey, you're close to 100% on that mask. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to back it off. I'm going to tone it down a little. And that's pretty good exposure right there, especially with her skin. Now, we haven't white balanced yet. That's why she looks so orange. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, the lighting that we're using in here, this total light, is a very different color temperature than these studio lights. These studio lights are LED, and this total light is, is a... Uh, quartz uh, tungsten bulb. So very different color temperatures. Yeah, very and warm. So, you know, so we, you know, who knows? It doesn't automatically mean it's wrong. It just means it's, it's, it's something to be aware of. Uh, so we're moving on in a way to another subject that's kind of related, but to the subject of color temperature, we sometimes talk about trying to do creative use of your color, of your white balancing, creative mm -hmm. use of your color temperature. You might like the way this looks. You know, you might think, oh, she looks so golden, and maybe this is like supposed to be a sunset <laughs> moment or something. Yeah. In that case, don't mess with it. Leave, mm -hmm. leave it alone. It looks, it looks like that type of mood. But if you're thinking, no, I just want this to be a straight up interview, she's going to talk about her film that she's been working on, then maybe this is not the mood I want, you know? And so in that case, I would want a white balance. So if I, if I go to my white balance, um, presets here and start to dial through them. Um, actually, I'm using the preset one, so I don't even need the white paper. Mm. Yeah, um, but you can see I've already changed it to a totally different color. Yeah, now this kind of feels a little bit more like under like a neon light at night type situation, I feel. It's a little, little bluer. Of course, I'm just looking at the monitor. Oops, I just did a white, a black balance by accident. <laughs> um, um, like, I'm sure that the color on this monitor that I'm looking at is probably different from the color that he's looking at his LCD screen, which is also going to be different from the color that you're seeing at home through the Zoom session. Um, so, yeah, it's once you start thinking about it, you do realize that it is kind of all relative, um, and there really is no absolute right at the end of the day. It is kind of just what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, um, those are artistic choices you have mm -hmm. um, with your white balancing. And using the zebra is kind of your first step. You don't, I don't think you want to start even trying to white balance until you've set a good exposure with your camera. You want to yeah. have, you know, because if it's too bright, then your white balancing is not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. So you have to get your exposure properly set first, and then you can uh, tackle those creative choices with your color, with your white balancing. Yeah, now, I, you, if you guys are comfortable with white balancing, we won't have to get into the details of how to white balance, but. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think that, I see another yeah. question. Can't quite read it from here. Uh, can you talk about gain and high and low gain? So are you referring to the gain on the, on the camera, like the, um, yeah, I think they mean the gain so. on the camera. Yeah, so, okay, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so the gain is on the camera. That's a way to kind of uh, artificially brighten the image. It, it doesn't mean that the iris is getting any bigger. It doesn't mean that it's really changing what you're seeing um, or what's actually going into the camera as far as light goes. 
It's just artificially brightening it so you can um, kind of get a better image. And, and I kind of tell people that, you know, using the gain is always a last resort type of situation. So um, if you look over here, if you can see my finger pointing at the, uh, the gain right here, I set to L for low. And then I could set it for, so M is medium and then H obviously is high. Um, and you can see even on the screen, on the LCD screen, uh, that zero dB, that's referring to the gain. Now it's set to six dB and now it's set to 12 dB. Um, so yeah, I usually always tell people this is, this is kind of your last resort. You know, you're gonna use the gain um, only if you're like shooting something that indoors that's very dark or at night. Um, then, then yeah, you would wanna turn on the gain. So uh, right now, here's the gain set to low to zero. So you see what the image looks like now. Let me get something that's not just the face of the camera. Yeah. All right, there we go. Um, okay, cool. So now I'm, I'm set to low gain. Um, oh, I got a nice little lens flare going on there. Ooh. <laughs> All right. Oh, I'm set on autofocus, you guys. Horrible. Usually we find uh, the people using the equipment, the previous users before you touch it, mm -hmm. they all often seem to just put it in automatic, which obviously means nobody's listening to us. They're not taking our <laughs> advice. No, unfortunately not. All right, let me make sure I got a good looking. So you're going to shot of Eric. If here. you're going to for a low uh, or high gain example, then I guess you don't need this light. No. So I'm yeah. going to turn this light off. Mm -hmm. See, now I'm in the dark. Okay, so then here he is in low gain, so that's, that's zero dB. And then here it is at uh, medium at six. And you see it's a slight difference, but you can see it. Um, maybe we can lower the lighting level in the studio. Yeah, we get even Bring it down example. really a lot, and that way we, she's going to have to use her high gain yeah. feature. So um, then. So here we go. We're going to bring, bring down some of these lights. Yeah. Maybe. Um, there we go. So right now there. I have it set to high gain. And actually still looks pretty good. It looks, it looks pretty good, but it looks a little grainy. It's starting, yeah, that's what happens when you turn on the gain, is that it's, the, the image is just going to get grainier, yeah. uh, grainier and grainier, um, yeah. which, uh, you know, actually can be a stylistic choice in and of itself. If you want to have a kind of a grainy, shaky image, if you want it to kind of look that way, then by all means go for it. Um, but if you're really trying to get a good image, um, if you can, throw more light on it as opposed to using the gain. Um, but obviously, you know, in certain situations, if you're like recording some sort of like live band and you're like indoors and you don't really, you know, you don't really have the space to set up lights or maybe it's an event, you know, you can't really be carrying, lugging lights around with you every moment of the day, um, then yeah, you will have to use the gain. But uh, I think the, the other thing, especially if you're doing some sort of event type thing, and if you're kind of walking around, wandering, maybe getting interviews, um, then I would definitely suggest using this little panel light. Um, so yeah, this is a good this is a good solution if you're going to be you know kind of running and gunning as as they say. If you're going to be kind of out and about and you don't really have the time or the capacity or the ability to set up um, a bunch of lights, then yeah, then you're going to want to use this little light panel. Um, it it's just a little LED light panel, nothing crazy. Um, it's the light it, it throws out is a little bit blue, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, you can actually, if you wanted to, put a little gel. You could cut out a little gel, just stick it right on here, uh, and to get more of a color temperature that you like. Um, but yeah, this is a good solution for when you are doing some sort of event work and you're not going to be able to set up lights. Um, obviously, in, in this scenario, then you're going to have to be really close to your subject. All right, there we go. Ooh. So, and I can also you know, dim it and brighten it. So yeah, this is a really good solution. Um, if you know that like, if you don't, if you're doing something that's a little bit more verite footage, you know, you're, you're kind of going out in the world and not really don't, don't know quite yet what you're gonna get, um, it's kind of good to be a little prepared by using the slide panel. All right, do we have any other questions? Let's see. Um, 
Door. If gain, if backlighting from large windows are producing black silhouette, okay, do we use gain? Um, you know what, gain would not help in that situation. Uh, yeah, it, it'll really just still make, because your camera's still um, getting in that light, that light information is still coming in, the gain is not going to be able to fix that. All that's going to do is make everything bright, including the window. So I would suggest either not having the window as your, your backdrop, number one. Um, you know, I would suggest maybe then instead using that big bay window as maybe your key light instead. So maybe re rearranging your set instead of trying to make the image work um, in, in that way. Uh, so yeah, I would definitely suggest just kind of using, using the space differently. Um, but yeah, it's, it's important to not um, just kind of like, you're not tied to the spot where you set up the camera, you know, that there's a reason why it's on a tripod and is movable, is that you can get the shot you want and the shot you need. So being flexible in that way, kind of rethinking in that way. Um, as opposed to trying to make the adjustments in camera or in post. It can be very hard to get a shot like that that you have your heart set on where you have a beautiful background and it's somebody sitting in front of a big window or whatever. It's, everything is bright behind them and you mm -hmm. wish you could get both their face and that beautiful background. But the background is, you know, if it's lit by the sun, it's, it's way more powerful than these, any of these little lights that you can mount on your camera, yeah. they're, they're not going to help all that much, you know, to get to make, because that's the goal is to put enough light on your subject that you can, they can compete with that bright background. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you have to open up your iris a lot on your camera to be able to bring that subject out. Otherwise, you're right, there will be a silhouette. But when you open up the iris that much, the background is going to just get way brighter than it was. It's going right. to blow out, and you lose that beautiful background that you wanted to have in your scene. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's just blown out and washed out. It's not it's featureless really because it's just a blob of of brightness. And so yeah. you know, it's just it's that's one of those cases where you cannot really have your cake and eat it too. You can't have the best of both of those right. particular things in that scenario. It's not it's a losing proposition. I wouldn't really try that. I would you know, reposition in some way, you know, but but you know, one thing you can do in that case where you really want that background and you really want that person in the in the foreground shoot at a completely different time of day. Yes so that you know the sun instead of being behind the person is more in front of them so you might have to you know settle for shooting it at a sunset instead of sunrise or vice versa depending on where you are mm -hmm. uh, you just have to you have to take it into account yeah um, and even yeah. even with doing that even if you were to choose a different time of day you know the the thing about the sun is as great of a light source as it is it is also constantly changing it's all always getting darker or brighter so if you've got you know if you're sitting down for a 2 hour long interview and you start it at you know 4 p.m. by 6 p.m. your image is just going to inherently get darker cuz the sun is going away so um so yeah as as great as natural light is as a tool you do have to kind of constantly be adjusting for that you know you might have to take a break reset your your um your exposure and just kind of rethink the image a little bit if you are going to be using the sun as your key. Yeah, the, the only way you can really pull it off, if you really want, you can picture <laughs> it in your mind, incredibly bright, beautiful, tropical background, whatever it is, and a person perfectly lit and perfectly exposed and sharp in the foreground, really the only way you can pull that off is if you use like green screen effect. Mm -hmm and you shoot your subject in a controlled environment with your key light, your fill light, backlight, you know, in front of a nice, broadly lit, evenly lit green background. And then in post-production and editing, that's when you can plug in that incredible sunset or sunrise with the ocean and the waves and all that, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and, and put them both together in post-production. And it's really not that hard. It's actually pretty simple, especially nowadays with software. It can be done with Premiere Elements version 12. I mean, mm -hmm. that has green screen capability. 
And I'm, I'm telling you, it's so ridiculously easy that you'll be surprised and be wondering, oh, why didn't I try this earlier? You know, it's, you really don't need much expertise to use green screen. You mostly just have to be sure that the recording is done properly, that the lighting on the subject is good, that the lighting on the background doesn't, you know, the green doesn't have a lot of any shadows on it mm -hmm. and is evenly lit. And so if you can record it properly like that, uh, then in post-production, it'll be so easy. It'll be a breeze to plug in some other, you know, subject into the background. Yeah. Um, so I would, uh, you know, invite you to give that a try. Just experiment with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually here at CAN, uh, we're playing around with a um, portable green screen setup that we're hope hoping to make available to, um, to producers if you want to use that. Instead, you can actually uh, rent that out and set it up wherever you like, set up the lights, um, and do it that way. Uh, we're going to wrap up here in a little bit. So um, we're going to see, maybe take a, one or two more questions. Uh, yeah, there's uh, two questions that we haven't addressed yet. Okay. Uh, one of them was someone asking, R Ruthie was asking about, can we recommend a particular brand of camera to experiment with that is similar to the studio cameras in, in quality? Um, mm. That's a hard one. Yeah. That's it. We would have to ask you a bunch of questions first before we can answer that. We'd have to ask you, what's your budget? Mm -hmm. How much money do you want to spend? Um, what's your goal with that? What's your final intention with that? Um, you know, if you just want to master it so that you can master the studio cameras, then probably the better thing is to set up a practice session with us instead of spending a bunch of money on a, on a very expensive camera. Right. Because these are high, these are studio, these are, are professional cameras that we have in the studio. So unless you really have a trust fund or whatever, you're not going to want to, you're not going to be able to get a camera of that quality level to right. experiment with. Yeah. So, Zazel, did you have a question? I heard your voice for a second there. I was laughing. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> laughing. That's good. Uh, don't, I mean, we're laughing with you, Ruthie, not laughing yeah. at you. But, you know, I'm just saying that's, that's a hard question to answer without having a deeper conversation with you. Um, the other no, question. I was her, her comment, you say trust fund. Oh, oh yeah, okay, the trust fund, okay. <laughs> so the other question had to do with uh, depth of field and focus um, um, after, after moving a camera. Um, um, something, I can't Oh, remember. focus. Oh, okay. So, yeah, that, so, yeah if every, every time you move a camera, you got to get focus again. Even if you are moving just three inches to the left, um, that can make a difference, especially when you're working with something like depth of field. If it is a very shallow depth of field, that small amount of movement is going to change your focus. Um, yeah. Especially if the lighting lo is low. If you don't have a lot of strong light, if you're not shooting in daylight, for example, then depth of field is a lot r less uh, deep. It's, it's reduced. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you, you're you going to have to definitely be on top of your focus, like, constantly. There's two things you want to always be attentive of when you're shooting is your audio and your focus. So those are crucial two things that if, yes. if either of those is not done well, you're going to be so sad later in post-production with, with either a blurry image or distorted audio. Yeah. So anyway, well, that's all the time we have today, everybody. So we just want to thank you, who those of you who did tune in. Yeah, thank you thanks so for much. coming in. Yeah. It was actually okay. fun. Andrew, I'm going to call you later on this week. All right. Sounds good. So, yeah, hopefully you'll see us again in one of our other workshops. Yeah. Also, let us know if you have any workshops you want to see. Um, we're open to ideas. Yeah. So take care, everybody. Just write us at training at cantv.org if you have any questions. Just drop us a line, as they say, and we'll try to answer it. Yeah. So stay safe, everybody. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye-bye.